Hey, what's up? It's Tobin. This is Fuzzy Tolerance Screencast number... Oh, oh. Fail. Fail. Number 12. This is Fuzzy Tolerance Screencast number 12. Uh, we're going to be taking a more in-depth look at Tile Mill. Last month, we kind of kicked the tires a bit. We made some tiles. Not tiles that you'd want to really show anyone. We made some tiles and went through kind of the basics of how it works and what it was. Now we are going to be doing some more detailed stuff. We're going to make some tiles that, unless you work at Development Seed, you probably wouldn't be embarrassed to show anyone. And uh, we'll look at styling your streets, which is always one of the hardest things. We're going to look at doing some markers with SVG symbols. We're going to look at doing buildings in 3D or 2.5D if you're one of those and we will look at using some rasters in it doing some you know basic hill shading sort of crap so let's take a look let's look the final product we're going to make looks something like this and the relief map stuff I probably wouldn't leave in it if I was doing our base tiles uh, it, mainly because it doesn't do anyone in our area a lot of good the relief in Charlotte ranges from about 600 feet to about 600 feet so uh, it's really not very helpful I always loved when I was in geography school the, the really cool colorful relief maps of the mountains and stuff like ah that's that's what I want to make Went to work in Charlotte. We have no hills. But I wanted to just put it there so you see how to do some imagery type stuff. And you see some, you know, we got streets, we got buildings, we got 2D buildings with uh, different symbology and arrows and labels and these little tiny green points. Now there are trees and now there are bigger trees. And you've got the whole DM in the background kind of business. That's basically what we're going to make. Now, for this one, usually I make you suffer through me typing all this crap out. Uh, it's usually because I haven't typed the crap out yet is really the main reason. Um, this time, I'm just kind of going to go over what I did. Because when I do things like styling, it's a, a litany of, you know, Control S, F5, suck. Control S, F5, suck. Just thousands of times until I get something my uh, I like so why don't we just skip that I won't put you through that pain let's turn off everything but the roads we will start there now the roads I more or less stole from the uh, DC example that comes with tile mill and as I was going through it when I first looked at it I was like oh man why'd they do that why did they load the roads like three times? Why did they separate out the what color you make the roads versus what size the roads are? Why would they do that? That's a terrible idea. I got to actually doing the roads. It's actually a great idea. So we are loading the roads three times. We're going to load it once with a class of highway and fill. That is going to be on a 2D type road. The inner boundary like this will be the light pink purple here we'll have a uh, that's a fill we have a roads highway line class highway again and class line and that is going to be that outer boundary that kind of one pixel border on those 2d roads and then near the very top of the stack we're going to have uh, our highway labels or it's just uh, when I say highway, I mean all the roads we're going to label the roads there. So they're kind of on top of almost everything else except for the buildings. Now, when you're styling a complicated layer like the roads, it's a good idea to put it in its own little CSS file. You can add as many files here as you want. You can make one for each layer. You can make several ones for complicated layers, however you want to do it. And the way it works is the last one in line here wins. So if I set the background to white here and set it to black here, 
Well, black's the last one in, black wins. So that's that's how that works. So I put this in a different layer. Up at the top, we're having some variable declarations. This is why I really suspect TileMill uses uh, SAS or, or, or something like it on the back end to kind of compile CSS. It has to get compiled back to probably XML for MapNick anyway. Um, which, which is really handy here. I don't really like that stuff for regular web development just because whenever I have to have a compile step in regular web development, something's probably gone wrong. But up at the top, we're going to set some colors. And basically, we've got three colors we're looking at. One for the secondary roads, one for the highways, and one for the interstates and ramps. And when you set a color, like uh, you can say primary equals trunk. So the primary color is just basically what we set it up here. We're also going to have a variable that's essentially a font stack for when we do our labels. Now this is kind of like a CSS font stack. It's, it's a little different. Than, with CSS font stack, you're sending out a web page. You're doing it because you don't know what fonts that user has installed. You know, if I'm building tiles from my stuff, I know what fonts I have installed, so I probably don't need to do a whole stack. This is handy if you plan on passing this off to someone else. They can look at it and uh, it will essentially have fallback fonts if they didn't have Ubuntu regular, say, uh, right at the top. Ooh, fish eye neat. I'll do that for the rest of this code so it's a little more zoomed in. So, that's how we're setting our variables. Now the first section we're going to do is colors. And when I first looked at what they did with DC streets, I looked at it and said, why in the world would they separate out colors and widths? Well, it's a very good reason. You might want to vary these things at different levels. You might want, you might have, say, a highway type colors, and this is all you need. For that for the fill and the line symbol for highways. How you set the widths might vary on every single zoom level. So it makes sense to separate those out. Is this fisheye driving you nuts or is it helpful? I don't know. I can't hear you. Now our streets group has a our streets layer has a style group field in it and there's basically four different types. There's highway, there's ramps, there's primary streets, which are like these, uh, you know, major roads. And there's secondary, which is uh, not major roads. Sorry if you live on one of those. You're still important. So what we're doing is we have this line class layer and this fill class layer. The fill being the inner, the line being the outer boundary. So one of the neat things they did in that DC example, all right, fish eyes driving me nuts. One of the neat things they did there is they have one color for, say, the interstates. You see the interstates are two colors here, a, a kind of light purple and a dark purple. What they do is they make that inner fill the color they pick, and to make the outline, they simply take that color and darken it. And what's really, and what the spin does is it darkens it along a certain path on the color wheel, which uh, I got to tell you, I don't understand colors and color wheels, but uh, it's a good thing here. So say these roads are pinkish here and the outlines are a darker version of that. You could change that right at the top, say, go to color lovers. Find a color you like. Mm, minty fresh. What's minty fresh? Say that hex. Drop that in there for motorway. Hit save. Now you've got that minty fresh with a darker green boundary, and that's all you had to do to change the inner and outer colors. So that is really handy. We'll change that back. So we're basically setting for different zoom levels the inner and outer colors. For this secondary, um, 
when you see these different zoom levels, what you're seeing here is the secondary uh, will not get a 2D type road until it hits about zoom level 15. And that's where it gives a fill type. Otherwise, it's a one dimensional road. That's essentially what that means. When the interstates, if we ever got back out to less than zoom level seven, or less than equal to seven, you'd essentially, or, or less than 10, you would essentially be looking at a 1D road instead of this kind of uh, 2D road. That's all that does to set the colors. Very simple. Widths, same sort of stuff. Yeah, you know, widths were going basically almost every zoom level we're screwing with something. Now you see here at zoom level 13, I'm going to fish eye that. Can't decide whether I like this fish eye or not. Zoom level 13 you have a line for the secondary but no fill styling because at zoom level 13 and zoom level 14 you're basically looking at a one-dimensional line. We zoom into 15 you see now that secondary road is two-dimensional you'll see at zoom level 15 we have a line and a fill style for that type of secondary. What you see here for the width what they're doing is Secondly, that secondary, the inner, gets a four uh, pixel width. What it does is it takes that same width and just adds two to it for the secondary. That way you are two pixels wider than the inner fill, which means you get to see that boundary. You could just put six there. But, but, but that, when I first saw it, I was like, what, uh, math? I don't do math in CSS. But that, that's, uh, that's what that is. So there we're doing all the, the colors all the way to greater than or equal to 17. So every zoom level, 14, 15, 16, and then 17 and 18, 17 and 18 have the same, but they, every zoom level has a different width. Now it's, it's really kind of a cool thing to when you zoom in, the things on the screen should maybe get a little bigger. That gives you the physical effect of zooming in. So when you zoom from say here to here, maybe the highway symbol gets a little bigger. The secondary roads are now 2D, they're bigger. The, uh, the interstates are bigger. So it gives you that feeling of actually getting closer as you zoom in. Very, very good kind of visual effect. Your user probably won't even be able to articulate that, but they, they will notice it. Now, one-way arrows. This is really easy. Basically, I'm taking that highway fill type or fill class, which is the top, uh, the highest level roads except for the labels. And I'm giving it a new class of this one-way arrow. So this styling will only affect this particular class. Say zoom level greater than 15 and I have a field in our roads layer that's one way. If it's greater than zero, uh, we have a one-way field that I thought was like uh, was basically a bit field zero or one. There's actually some twos in there. I don't know what the hell that means, but I'm decided they were one-way straights. So marker type is arrow. Give it some color and opacity. Marker spacing. What this does is say don't put arrows more than 200 within 200 meters uh, of each other. If you didn't have that, you'd get arrows on every segment and that would make you sick. So it's just taking that same motorway color and darkening it and dropping it on there. And that, what that does is it, it just gives you these one-way arrows. And if you're like in downtown Charlotte where everything is one way, this can be really helpful if your, your, your users can see that. The arrow is going in the direction of the line. Uh, lines have a from node and a to node. It's going that way. Here's where you found out if you need, you'll find out if you need to flip some segments or not. For the labels, again, I mean, look at this. This, this is, uh, the whole thing is, is fairly short to do all the streets. And streets is probably the hardest thing you have to symbolize in your whole tile set. This highway, highway Labels class, which is this 
version of the rows right here. We're just giving it, we're registering that font stamp we looked at. Uh, well, this text name equals nothing basically means don't label anything at this point. We're just setting some global parameters for for this set of labels. Know this text min distance is, is the same as this uh, marker spacing, more or less. Basically says don't write crap on every single one. Like if I took this out. Ooh, sucky. So let your labels breathe. Give them some space. For our style group highway and zoom level greater than or equal to 12, we're going to, this whole street name is, is the field that has our street, whole street name in it. Whole street name. Back when we first made a center line, we were really conservative with our, our uh, uh, field names. We tend to spell them out now. But we're giving it a halo that is essentially the same as this fill color, only slightly lighter. That gives a subtle kind of halo effect. Usually people do halos like, I want 10 pixels of screaming pink or something, and it's just, you know, damn my eyes. But here you're giving a sub subtle effect based on what essentially the background of that label is going to be. Same way for our primary streets and our secondary streets, we're just setting different zoom levels. And you can also see, like on our highways, as we zoom in, that font will get a little bit bigger. Again, as you zoom in, things should get bigger. So that is streets. That is basically all we had to do to uh, get this over here with labels and different level of 1D and 2D roads and arrows and all that happy crap. And again, development seed folks deserve credit for this because I mostly stole this from, from the DC stuff. Now let's look at some other stuff. Let's look at some buildings and some, what I'm going to call trees. They're, they're, really, uh, they're really bus stops, but I'm calling them trees. It'd be really cool if we had a point layer of all the trees, <laughs> but, but we don't. And we'll look at our raster stuff. First, buildings. Because this is actually very cool. See, we've got buildings. It comes on at zoom level 15. So we zoom back out one, you're not going to see buildings. What happens if we go to zoom level 16 or greater? We have two dimensional buildings. Huh. Trash that. We have 2.5 or three dimensional buildings. You can see they're sticking right up. And they are of varying height. There's basically a field in our buildings layer that has a height in it. Right now it's just randomly generated heights. I have to go uh, uh, LIDAR wrestling at some point to yank some heights out of there. But how cool is that? To get that to work, you have to hack tile mill a touch. Basically, you'll go to... Uh, you're look, looking for this reference.json. Oh, you can't see that over there. Which is in, it's just in a, uh, it's just in a ridiculous place. It's like a, it'll be wherever your tile mill base install is. Being like tile mill node modules, carto lib carto tree j, reference dot JSON. Yeah. But anyway, one of the nice things about tile mill is it's it's Node.js based, which means to hack it, you don't have to go, you know, download the source code and then or do some stuff and then compile it. And basically, uh, the compiled code for for JavaScript is just the JavaScript. So this reference.json, if you look for this building. Uh, I'm going to drive people nuts with this fisheye. If you look for this building type and go to height, normally this is, type is set to float and it's looking for a number there. So you could put in like 150 and it'd jump every building up by 150, uh, I guess it'd be meters in, in this projection. 
Uh, that's great, but it won't let you put it in a field. If you change this to string, you can put in a field value in a quotes like this height, and here I'm reducing the size a little bit so it doesn't jump up too much. And voila, we are getting these 2.5D building heights based on a field in the building's footprint. If you had real heights in there, you could show the real height of those features. Now, if you wanted to do it by flat number now, you'd have to go building height and put like 150 in quotes. So it's, you know, it's a little hackish. Remember that you did this in case something goes wrong later. But it lets you make these 2.5D buildings with actual heights. And here I've set an opacity form so you can kind of see through the walls. So you can see through, see like this street label and that arrow on the other side of that building. Here I'm doing times 0.75. So you can take, if you have an actual height and you think it's too big or too small, you can, you know, bump it up or down right there. How cool is that? I, I uh, Well, I thought that was cool. But, you know, I'm weird. Now let's talk trees. One of the nice things, uh, and you can do this with like GeoServer and other stuff too, is you can use an SVG for a marker. Nice thing about that, and here I just took an, a tree marker from like uh, openclipart.org and modified it a bit and gave it a little drop shadowy thing, which you really can't even see on the map. But Plain old SVG, you can edit and make them in Inkscape. An SVG will scale perfectly. It's not like a bitmap that will stretch. It's a text description of an image, and it will scale perfectly because it's not rendered in the bitmap. It's rendered as it goes. So you see, we get, we'll get we go from this zoom level. We have it as a point. When we get to greater than 16, we will change it to this tree SVG and scale it to 0 0.15 the size we go to zoom level 18 we'll scale it to 0 0.3 the size and what that does see the tree size there as we zoom in see the tree is now about twice as big and again that gives you that illusion of I'm really zooming in these are real things I'm looking at so that's how you do an SVG marker now for the imagery for the like hill shade, slope shade, relief color kind of stuff, one thing to note is Tile Mill will reproject vector data like shape files and post just layers. It will not reproject rasters. So Goodle is your friend. Get to know Goodle. It will do all that for you. They have a very good raster. Uh, tutorials on the Mapbox site, particularly working with terrain data, goes through using Google Warp to project it and making the hill shades from a DEM, of course, hill shades and color ramps and putting them all together. Uh, there's also a really good tutorial on, on using Google for, for Dems uh, on Linfinity's blog, and I'll, I'll link to all this in the show notes. This dude right here, Smart dude. I would follow this blog. They have some really good posts in there. Anyway, we have a very subtle kind of effect. Again, we don't believe in hills in Mecklenburg County. We, we turn them into parking lots. Plus, we, we didn't have them to begin with. And I'm doing a very subtle kind of green here. That's just the shading, but I'm also doing a lot of opacity sort of stuff. You can really screw with uh, the coloring you want for this. Let's see, here's some relief. We can change the order of the, sl the relief and the hill shade type stuff and change the opacity of the, like right now it's a subtle hill shading. Why don't we bump it way up? And you can see, you know, what one might mistake for a hill, but is, is really probably just a bump. And that's how you can do rastery stuff. Again, it's not something I'd put on here because uh, elevation is really not a factor in Mecklenburg County much. 
but that's how you do it. It's very straightforward. Really all the work in there is using Goodle and Goodle is so blazingly fast. We had like a, I just have one uh, uh, imagine file for a dem for the county converting it to a TIFF and projecting it, converting it, it takes like 10 seconds. Same for making different hill shades and and slope shades and, and what have you. So get to know Goodle. It'll be your friend for life. That's basically how I did this whole thing. Basically all that's everything except for the roads. And this little bit right here is the roads. Very simple. If you make some very good looking tiles, you can see it. I've got it pulled up here. And I should say, again, Tile Mill is the fastest tile spitter outer I've ever seen. This tile set, which includes three different raster layers and the, all the labeling with the streets and the 2.5D building, from zoom level 14 to 18 took 29 seconds. And that's for, uh, I think I wrote it down. So made 3,600 images in 29 seconds, did the whole thing. You can see we've got the secondary roads are 1D. Now they're 2D and we got building footprints. Now we've got building footprints up in the air along with things like uh, directional arrows on the streets. Now you've got trees and uh, now you've got a uh, tree vanished. Must be under that, sunk under a, a building at that zoom level. But uh, there you go. That's Tile Mill making some decent looking tiles. I think over the next month, if I can get these other whaling projects off of my back, I'm going to make a whole new tile set from Mecklenburg that we'll use for our, our base tiles. But I think that's all I wanted to tell you. Again, Tile Mill is fantastic. You should definitely check it out. And you can throw these tiles on your web server as just one file. Like this 3600 images was like a, like a 30 megabyte uh, SQLite database. Normally, you know, I, I, I'm a firm believer that every time you put binaries in a database, uh, God kills a kitten. But in this case, it's very, very handy. I used to just take that one file and just fling it to a server. And I've just got plain old something server side, php.asp.net, whatever. It'll just take XYZ requests and pull those tiles back and fling them back at the user. Perfect. Very, uh, very uh, low footprint, very hard to break type of setup. So check tile mill out and I'll, I'll probably post an update just on the vlog when I have these tiles out on one of our sites. And I think that's it. I have no idea what I'm going to talk about next month, but I'm sure whatever it is, it will be something. So have a good weekend. Bye-bye.